Tonight on Joy News Prime, Lansing Natural Resources Minister says government will continue to burn excavators and other equipment used in illegal mining, especially those found in riverbeds, because the phenomenon is an extraordinary problem. We have details of a consultative meeting in the Ashanti Regional Capital of Kumasi at which the Santahini also lent his support to the campaign. Progressive People's Party says a constitutional amendment is what is needed to address the concerns of the fixed Ghana movement. Like this, but that is just playing around um, the issue. The real issue for the blueprint for the development of this nation, for people to become impartial, for people to not look at the political affiliation to be able to do their work. They, they need a total autonomy and independence. The party says it is also opposed to the introduction of new taxes because government has failed to account for taxes collected in the past. Electricity is rampant. Fix the electricity. Our water, we can't get the water to drink clean water. Fix the water issue. We have potholes in our roads. Fix the potholes. CTTV journalists detained by national security operatives for taking photos at their premises. Tox speaks, has been speaking about the slaps he endured in detention. We get a reaction from the Ghana Journalist Association. Not the playground. Security intentions were applied at all times. So whether he, he was taking shots of vehicles or, or he might be in the area, still a security so, so the law must apply. In business, prices of petroleum products expected to go up by more than 2% from next week as developments in the U.S. hit the value of the commodity across the world. Also in the bulletin, Fancy Pin School at Dissadel College University practices such as Anasin State College qualify for Thursday's finals of the Central Region National Science and Maths Quiz Contest. We have details of how things unfolded. My name is Israel Lai and Join News Prime is coming to you live from our Final Four studios at Kokomimi here in Accra on your digital terrestrial TV because we're free to air and also on DSTV channel 421 and Go TV channel 144. This is a home of independent, fearless, credible and impactful journalism. Stay tuned in. The Progressive People's Party is the latest group to add its voice to the Fix the Country campaign, saying an amendment of the Constitution is what will be needed to address the concerns of the movement. Taking on government, the party described the fight against illegal mining as camouflage, alleging government officials own concessions, but they have been shielded by security operatives. The party held uh, at a news conference at its headquarters Wednesday, where, from where join us is for Stina Safo, reports we are happy for the call of the youth all over the country calling for fixing the country we are supported of the youth standing up to make government accountable for after all governments came into power promising to fix our country so now electricity is rampant fix the electricity our water we can't get the water to drink clean water Fix the water issue. We have potholes in our roads. Fix the potholes because you said that you were going to fix the country. A call on government to fix the constitution as the Progressive People's Party joins the Fix the Country campaign. The government earlier this week announced a five point plan to address complaints by the Fix the Country movement. But the party believes the amendment of the constitution should have featured on that plan. We want to make sure that the, there's a permanence in terms of the separation between the Minister of Justice and that of the Attorney General. There must be a permanence in which that the Minister of Justice is an advisor to the President. Then the Attorney General fights on behalf of citizens. We have tried something like this with a special prosecutor, but that is just playing around. Um, the issue, the real issue for the blueprint for the development of this nation, for people to become impartial, for people to not look at the political affiliation to be able to do their work. They, they need a total autonomy and independence. The party wants the government to start prosecuting kingpins involved in illegal mining, alleging security operatives are shielding government officials who own concessions. We have had reportage 
of government officials being part of this galaxy menace. And we have not seen anybody in court over the matter. That is why you need to strengthen the separation of Minister of Justice from Attorney General. Because until these fundamental things are done, these will be just camouflage fights on Galaxy. Why are they burning excavators? When the same excavators can be confiscated, used for dredging and other activities of the state that we need, why can't we use the energy to create another positive energy to solve a problem somewhere? So you see that people are doing knee-jerk reactions to the resolution of the Galaxy menace. The party is also pushing for a halt in the introduction of new taxes, stressing government's failure to account for taxes collected in the past is unacceptable. We are where we are with the old taxes. You are introducing new taxes. You see, it's not about taxes that citizens do not want to pay. It's about what they have received over the years in paying taxes that they have not seen any tangible output. That is where the challenge is. So if you continue to tax and the citizens are not feeling the impact of your taxation in their day-to-day -day lives, it becomes, that is why people fight against it. Because there must be a correlation between the taxation and the challenges that exist for it to be solved. On the intermittent power outages, it called on government to come clean, insisting the problem is more financial. It is also proposing the expansion of road infrastructure to address the issue of traffic congestion in the capital. What they say does not, sometimes it does not make sense. You are building a new power station. How does it that you are building a new power station gives us blackouts? What's the correlation? Because usually when you are building a new power station, part of the engineering builder is to be able to have a way in which you are able to seamlessly tie into the system. So you are building a power station somewhere. How does it affect my black house here? You see, because the issue with the energy sector has to do with funding. It's our ability to fund many of the projects, projects which are many are overpriced. For in another development, Deputy Majority Leader Alexander Apenyo Marking believes a failure on the part of government communication on the real issues facing the country is what has contributed to anger about hardships. He believes successive governments have failed to adequately sensitize the people on the need to raise taxes and also borrow to provide their needs. Responding to questions about the recent Fix the Country agitations, Mr. Apenyo Marking argued that the people would be more charitable if they understand the difficulties in governance. He spoke on PM Express on the Joiners Channel. People complain of uh, lack of water and all that. And I'm able to tell them what effort I've put in place, what intervention government has done in certain areas, and why this has delayed. Say you expect to have 20 kilometers of road constructed, but we've done five. You explain what the issues are. I think that if they have a perception you are doing nothing, they will realize, oh, okay, let's go along. I am saying that the real challenges that we face, perhaps, mm -hmm. we haven't explained them well. But you, you, but you, but, and but you don't have to explain to me when I can feel the bad road. I'm see, driving on it. I'm you, sleeping you, in that. Have you I don't have water. Okay, so it's, exp it's Evans, explanation what I need. Evans, have, you, have you lived with an old lady before? I have. I lived with Did my you, grandmother. With your grandmother. Good. So, you know how our grandmothers behave? The thing is that they will explain to you that, look, this is what is there. And the, 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 the posture, the facial expression and all that, you better, you would understand her. And I, I, I want in your case because, because you know when you know, I'm driving a bus, you, you know are coming with a view that you don't feel the bad road. I will not appreciate my grandmother. We are spent, I understand because we are both so, hungry. So you don't need. We are both hungry. So, so in you your case, I see you drive so, your V8 past the road and it's nice. So, so that is why. That that's is why. So that is that is why it has to be explained. It comes back to the issue of communication. The Ghanaian voter would have to be aware or must know that 
the political leader needs certain facilities for the purpose of governance. Two, the Ghanaian voter needs that assurance that whatever resources that are there are not being wasted, are not being abused, and there are no leakages. I think that the problem is about the leakages, the perception that, look, they can do better. They are not doing it. And I'm also saying that, yes, it could be true. Now, government has made it clear. There has no plans to back down on the idea of burning of excavators used in illegal mining. The instant destruction of equipment, which has become characteristic of the latest phase of the war against Kalamse under the current Lands and Natural Resources Minister, has been criticized by many who say their action flies in the face of the law being used to fight illegal mining. The small-scale miners especially are threatening to sue if government does not stop the destruction of the equipment. Speaking at the Regional Consultative Dialogue on Small-Scale Mining in Kumasi Wednesday, Sector Minister Samuel Jinapo said the use, of, the use of excavators for mining at river banks was, quote, an extraordinary problem which requires extraordinary measures to deal with, end quote. Erasa Sosaradonko is on this beat for us in Father's Report. The regional consultative dialogue attracted members of the Kumasi Traditional Council, small-scale miners, members of the Regional Security Council, and the general public. All the speakers acknowledged the presence of unseen powerful faces behind illegal mining in the country. Ashanti Regional Minister Simon Osei-Mensa called for the naming and shaming of government appointees behind the illegality. The destruction of our farmlands affects food security in this country. Also, the destruction of our water bodies has disastrous consequences on this country. My colleague government appointees, we have to lead the fight. And I think any government appointee who is found engaging in illegal mining must be dealt with with the highest level of sanctions. It's time we name and shame. The Ghana Armed Forces recently led an onslaught on illegal miners on water bodies and forest reserves. The modus operandi of the team, including burning of excavators, has raised concerns. But Lands Minister Abdullah Jinapo justified the mode of operations, emphasizing an what unwavering stance in the fight against illegal mining. This is about the preservation of our environment and ecosystem. It is about the welfare of generations unborn. It is about the survival of our country. It is without a shred of equivocation about Ghana. On behalf of the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources and myself, I reiterate our unwavering commitment to get on with this national crusade without fear or favor. Blind to partisan political coloration, blind to status in society, and with an absolute dedication steeped in the higher sense of integrity, we must and will preserve our environment. The Asantehne Otunfo Osetutu outlined recommendations towards winning the fight against illegal mining. The illegal mining situation is clearly complex and requires a carefully thought through multi-stakeholder approach if Ghana is to succeed in bringing it under control. With the exception of properly designed alluvial mining operations, mining near rivers and water bodies should be banned. Secondly, in accordance with the Minamata Convention to which Ghana is a signatory, the use of mercury for gold processing should be banned given its toxicity to human health and the environment. This should then be replaced with training and capacity building for small-scale miners on less dangerous means of gold recovery. Personal safety and sound environmental practices should be critical aspects of small-scale mining going forward. So, as is the situation for large-scale mines, reclamation and rehabilitation of mined out areas should be a key aspect of small-scale mining operations and renewal of such licenses should be contingent on effective land reclamation. So, DCEs as chairpersons of District Security Council should be held directly responsible for situation of illegal mining 
within their respective districts. Yes. No. Members of the Small Scale Mining Association are happy with the two force call for their involvement in the fight against the menace. Abdul Razak is National Communications Officer. The two force wisdom by saying that they should involve us in all the deliberation and discussions for the way forward of the uh, as, uh, this and tackling this illegal menace. That made uh, everybody very excited. Reporting for Joy News, Erastus Asaredonko Kumasi. All skill miners were themselves present at the event and have been reacting to the minister's position on the burning of excavators. Erastos, as Aradonko joins us with more. Erastos, what have the small skill miners had to say about the minister's stance on the burning of equipment? Well, so it's, it's two way. Uh, they are saying that they are not against uh, government's fight against illegal mining and all the measures being adopted by the military, uh, the operation halt activities and all that. But what they are concerned about is that some of their members are not mining uh, close to any river body. Uh, they have a license and they are working accordingly. And they have their equipment bent. And they do not understand that. And that is what they wanted the minister to come clear on the parameters of the operation uh, of the military uh, team on the field. And so they are okay with the military, with the, the minister's explanation that the military team has been given specific orders and they are to enforce the law on uh, miners who are operating close to river bodies, miners who are operating uh, in forest reserves, and that is the parameters they wanted the minister to mention. And so they are not against that but again they mentioned that some of their members had the equipment bent these were miners who were operating legally and away from these parameters and so they want government to come clean on what they will do either to pay for the equipment that they bent my brother, what, what, what was creating that excitement while he was speaking my brother uh, is good of uh, clarifying some of these things if you see a man of wisdom Nobody speaks, uh, nobody says it. The man is a king, he's a real king with wisdom. He speaks with wisdom. Things that he was raising, I think it is time overdue. Sometime in Ghana, anything that we do, we restrict people from speaking the truth. And when it comes that we will never go forward. Always people have an agenda and they want to veer off and uh, go with their agenda. You see the, uh, the, 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 the strong king, before he started his speech, he even made it clear that the big man came to him, restricted him of his speech, but he, he will at least point out one or two things. He made it clear to the whole world. And things that he said, he never missed words. Because you cannot fight illegal miners without inv the involvement of Minas Commission and the legal ones. At least before 1989, Illegal mining was dominated. So, it is nine that it became a law in Ghana, and we had these mineral laws and those things. Through that, the people of Ghana decided that they should have a minerals commission to be regulating these uh, people. At the same time, they formed EPA to be making sure they were managing this. But what was creating that excitement? The excitement was that he was. The excitement was that he was emphatic that minister. Before you can fight these people, liaise with this uh, association or liaise with small scale miners and the Minerals Commission. And all the time, all government upon government, any time that they want to deal with these illegal miners, they, 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 they do it on their own. They don't involve us. You see the regulatory body put aside, and then they will have their way of doing their own thing. And it's not helping. It has been years upon years that we've been fighting this thing, and it's not helping. It is not time for this government and the minister to understand that there are people who are into, into that industry. There are people who are real miners. Engage them. They know these illegal miners. And they can help you to fight them. But if you leave them, you put them aside and you want to do it your own way, it will be a difficult task. So, a two for us wisdom by saying that they should involve us in all the deliberation and discussions for the way forward of the uh, as, uh, this and tackling this illegal menace. That made uh, everybody very excited. And Erastus is still along the line with me. Erastus, I'm particularly interested in what it is that the, uh, Santa Hene wanted to say that he was restricted. Do you have any idea? Do you perchance happen to have an idea what it was? 
Well, he, he wanted to say the things that is impeding the efforts of successive governments in fighting illegal mining. And um, he even said a little bit of it before he started his speech. And he said that uh, he has been told to stick to his speech, but then he want to say that if they take the people in the auditorium, the Great Hall of the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology today, um, if we take 100% of them, 30% of them know who is doing illegal mining, and even 30% of them could be uh, doing illegal mining. And so we all know the truth. If we want to say the truth, we must say it. Otherwise, we'll be moving in circles. Those were his words. And he said he wants to go back to his speech so he doesn't say things that uh, he will regret later. All right, and I'm wondering who dares to try to stop the Asantini from speaking his mind. I'm imagining the kind of reaction that went out well, in the room. Well, the MC uh, referred to the regional minister uh, that he didn't know that the regional minister had the <laughs> uh, you know, capacity to be able to stop the Asantini from going to uh, say his mind. And they all laughed at it. But indeed... Uh, well, that's what he said, that uh, some of the organizers and big men had come to him to say that he must stick to his uh, speech. But he wanted to uh, let people know that we all know who uh, are the ones behind illegal mining. If we don't say the truth, we'll be moving around in circles. And by his own words, we'll be organizing some of these uh, fora and it will not end anywhere. At the end of it all, was there anything concrete that you took out of the forum? Yes, um, they all agreed that indeed there were pow powerful hands uh, behind uh, people who are mining in forest reserves and close to uh, river bodies. They are all in concert that uh, the use of mercury should be banned, as the Asante Hene said. Um, again, uh, mining close to rivers or water bodies should be banned uh, permanently. Um, the, uh, there should be a road map set up to regulate mining activities those who are into genuine mining should be encouraged and those who are mining should be identified arrested and made to face uh, the law so that we can mine but still have an environment clean uh, of, of all the things that we detest now all right thank you very much uh, rasta sasaradon for bringing us that update from the forum that took place in the ashanti region capital kumasi today there is growing condemnation of the use of brute force by national security operatives and the arrest of two city FM journalists for filming at a national security installation. Lawyer and current journalist of the year, Samson Ladia Yenini, insists the journalist filming abandoned vehicles at a place designated as a security zone is not a crime if the aim is to publish an issue of public interest. But president of the Ghana Journalists Association, Roland Afilmoni, says the City FM journalist Caleb Kude breached the code of ethics of the GJA by filming at a national security installation without permission, but was quick to condemn the disproportionate use of force by the security operatives. We'll be following with all consuming attention and all absorbing tears. The incidents which happened at the premises of National Security and also the uh, City FM. Um, number one, we see a palpable breach, palpable ethical breach relative to Article 13 of the GGA Code of Ethics, which dictates that journalists must obtain information, videos, data photographs and illustrations only by honest, straightforward, fair and open means unless otherwise tampered by public interest considerations. Um, well, you can see clearly that uh, Caleb's attempt or Caleb's attempt to video or take a photograph of happiness or whatever he is uh, too short of. Uh, breach this ethical uh, injunction. So this is where we are coming from. Um, as it is a point of lesson from which both sides must learn, the journalists, yes, even though we have all the back to the space, um, enshrined in Article 162, 163 of the 1992 Constitution, Article 164 imposes 
national security, national morality, and public order restrictions on the media. So this simply means that uh, any story we get or information we obtain should pass the test of national security, national morality, and public order. Uh, public order. Otherwise, we will step in. We find ourselves on the wrong side of the law. But, but Mr. Filmoni, uh, the, the concern then is uh, you've quoted um, Article 13, DJ Code of Ethics. On the other hand, also quoted the 1992 Constitution, amongst others. But the real concern here is that Caleb was filming vehicles parked at the National Security Installation, which is of public interest, which is a story uh, that has been running for some time, or a story that he's working on. How then is he breaching uh, these codes and then the law? Which law exists? Exactly, is he breaching when this story is in public interest? Um, um, I believe uh, you, you agree that uh, um, you can't just walk into the seat of government and then take pictures of vehicles parked outside there. A security zone is a security zone, not a playground. So the security intentions will apply at all times. Well, here's something Ladia Yunin insisting the filming is not a crime. He explains why. If you are a journalist or you are not, and there is something that is going on in the public place, public place, you are entitled to capture fame and reflect fame to the rest of us, more particularly because you are a journalist, reflect the same thing to the rest of us so that we get to see. Because we all have a stake in this enterprise called the state. And because the Constitution provides us certain duties, including in Article 40, 41, where it says that we have a duty to preserve the name of this republic. We have a duty to pay our taxes and work conscientiously. But we also have a duty to protect, to preserve public property and to combat misuse and waste. So if a journalist will take their camera, will take their pen, will take their phone, to reach to that public place and capture that article which you, you are misusing, which you are put you are leaving to waste, to reflect it to all of us. They are simply conducting a duty that the constitution allows. And in Article 162, Clause 5, it says that they have a duty to reflect all of these things to the people misuse and waste so if a journalist will take their camera will take their pen will take their phone to reach to that public place and capture that article which you, you are misusing which you are put you are leaving to waste to reflect it to all of us they are simply conducting a duty that the constitution allows and in Article 162, Clause 5, it says that they have a duty to reflect all of these things to the people. Well, there's more to this story. We're taking a break at this moment. But when we come back a lot later on, the city TV journalist detained by the National Security Operatives for taking the photos of the parked vehicles on its premises will be speaking about the slaps he endured in detention. Also, in the bulletin, prices of petroleum products are expected to go up by more than 2% from next week as developments in the U.S. hit the value of the commodity across the world. That's coming up in business right after this break. Just stay tuned in. We're back in a bit. Hello, good evening and welcome to business. Full prices are expected to go up again from next week. Now, this is based on data Joy Business has secured from the bulk distributors of the petroleum products. There is more on this in the following des business desk report. 
Based on this data, petrol is expected to be increased by 2.19%, while diesel is going up by 2.36%. From these adjustments, a liter of petrol will be sold at 6 Ghana cities 18 pesos, while diesel should go for at least 6 cities 19 pesos. The increase is as a result of the current development in the U.S. due to the cut in four supplies because of one of its major supply being hit by hackers. Now, why are we so sure about changes at the pumps from next week? Well, these are the prices that the bulk oil distribution firms have released for next week. So unless these oil marketing firms absorb the increase, consumers will definitely be paying more when they drive to any service station from Sunday the 16th of May. It had been earlier projected that current development on the international market would result in prices going up at the pumps in the coming days. The situation has been compounded by the recent taxes placed on these products. Meanwhile, the Ghana Public Road uh, Transport Union, GPRTU, is entreating the public to disregard any purported increase in transport fares. Now, this follows a meeting held with stakeholders and the Transport Ministry to review public transport fares for this year, which ended without an agreement. Let's pull up a press statement to this effect, of course, uh, issued out by the Executive Secretary of GPRTU, stating that a motion was tabled to bring clarity to some of the provisions in the Income Tax Tax Amendment Act 2021 and the Act in its current form suspends the payment of the vehicle income tax for taxis and trotro. However, its application has been shrouded with some ambiguities. The VIT constitutes part of the cost buildup for the determination of fares. It goes on to state the fact that they have commenced discussions with the Ministry of Finance and that of the GRA to bring clarity to the application of the vehicle income tax. Even as do so they are discounting claims and of course entreating the general public to discount any other purported increase in transport fares as they sit together to find an amicable solution to this particular development we shall, we shall be following this closely to give you updates as and when we do have them Away from that, inflation for the month of April this year remarkably fell to 8.5% from the 10.5% recorded in March. Now, it is the first single-digit rate recorded in the year following the, raven, the, the ravaging effects of COVID-19 on the economy. Here's more. The Greater Accra Region recorded the highest inflation rate of 12.1% in April this year, lower than that of March. According to the figures, food inflation declined marginally to 6.5%. For the non-food inflation, housing, water, electricity and gas recorded an inflation rate of 25%, down from 29% recorded in March 2021. Government statistician Professor Samuel Enim explains that this is the lowest rate to be recorded since the drastic effect of the COVID-19 pandemic on the Ghanaian economy. On a quarterly basis for the, for the period January to March 2021, the quarterly inflation rate is 10.2 relative to 10.1 that was recorded in the last quarter of 2020. Indeed, it is important to put this 8.5 inflation rate for the month of April 2021 in a context. This is largely driven by the jump in inflation in the month of March and April 2020, which moved from 7.8% to 10.6%. And given that inflation rate over the last six months have hovered around 10.0%, we're currently seeing a dip in inflation rate returning to a single digit of 8.5%, the, lo the lowest that have been recorded since the, since the COVID-19 um, period. Even though the Greater Accra Region recorded the highest rate of inflation, it had the lowest food inflation rate of 3.3%, whilst the Northern Region recorded the highest rate of food inflation at 10.7%. The fact that Greater Accra food inflation has significantly reduced, you understand? So we can hold that of Northern constant, but the reason why Greater Accra has significantly reduced, we all know because inflation in Greater Accra, again, was the highest last year. So again, given the base effect, that is what is leading to Greater Accra having a food inflation of 3.3. So if you hold that of Northern Region constant, the variation is mainly driven by the huge drop of food inflation in Greater Accra. Because during the COVID-19, we're recording double digits for Greater Accra food inflation. 
Also, the inflation rate for imported goods was 7.4% up from 6.8% recorded last month, while the inflation for locally produced items was 8.7% down from the 11.7% recorded last month. And that'll be it for business for this segment. My name is Charles IT. Sports is up next. Thank you for staying with us on Joy News. Prime Gary Al Smith here with the sport. Let's begin with the Black Stars because coach CK Akono has announced a 30 month squad to face Morocco and the Ivory Coast in the June international window. The former Ghana captain is expected to lead his charges into the two high profile games against North African giants, uh, Morocco and two-time African champions, the Ivory Coast, next month in place of the two FIFA World Cup qualifiers that got postponed, if you recall, last week. Now to the details. Richard Ofori, who missed the AFCON qualifiers in March, makes a return to the squad, having recovered from a groin injury. Now, Reading FC's Andy Yadom, Portugal-based Gideon Mensa, Shenzhen's Franca Champong, and inform forward Kamal Dean Suleimana, who plays for Nodjolan, have all made a return to the team for the two matches here's a full squad so for the goalkeepers the returner richard ofori razaka balora and ibrahim dalat all there then there is at the left back position baba Aman, gideon mensa and diadom for reading philemon bafo plays for dreams fc Alexander Jiku, Daniel Amate, Ismail Ganiu, Joseph J, and Nicolas Opoku. Joseph J plays for Ligon Cities. Midfield, Wakaso, Pate, Kudus, Rashid Norte, that's a new entrant from Midyama. After a sparkling last couple of games, he's been rewarded. Abdu Fatal Isahaku, that is the under 20 Afghan star, the young 16 year old. Emmanuel Lomote, Glatin Awako, and Baba Idrisu. Up front, on the left wing, there's Samuel Owusu, Emmanuel JC, Franka Champong, Tariq Fosu, Kamal Soa, Kamal Dean Suleimana gets those slots. Andre Ayu, Jordan, Kwame Opoku, and Joseph Pentil, who's been in a rich vein of form. So, the Morocco game will be played up north, and then, for the first time in a very, very, very long time, a high-profile friendly will be played here in Ghana. The Ivory Coast game will be played at the Cape Coast Stadium. So, uh, GFA definitely have done well with that. It's been a long time since we saw that. Meanwhile, Siki Akono is worried about the negative media reports around his players and the national team. He's asking the media to be more positive. Our team might not look attractive to you or to any of you here, but once we decide to work hard, come together as a team, as a unit, and this goes to all of you, all of you here. We need all of you, your support. The negativity is just too much. And so I plead with you, I'm not asking you, to, I'm pleading, I'm pleading to all of you, all of you, to stop the negativity. Start believing in us. Start believing and be positive about the things we do. When I, grew, I was growing up as a footballer, it was you guys who made me great. All of you here. Uh, well, probably at the time when I was playing, most of you will not be. The likes of Kwabna Yeboa, uh, Kar Tufu, they encouraged us. This time around, things have changed, and I plead with all of you to be positive. Yes, there are negative, neg negative in what we do. Criticize us positively, and we will find the right, right channel to, 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 to go about this. But everything is, is achievable. Ghana Premier League action. Now, how to folk play today? They've climbed to um, second of the Ghana Premier League table after a hard-fought win at Bichem United this afternoon. Uh, here are the full results of the match day. Uh, Brecum Chelsea 3 1 Ashgold. Dreams FC 3 0 Ken Faisal. Mediama 1 2 Wafa and Elmina Sharks 1 1 Karela. Bechem United 0 1 Heart of Folk. 
11 wonders 1 1 into allies and Legon Cities versus Liberty. Still to go. And um, that's it for sports for now. Gary L. Smith here will come on the other side of eight with more details. Uh, entertainment now. And uh, Becky Bex is here. I'm here. Always Becky here. Becky. I'm very excited because tomorrow is a holiday. So let me just give you something uh, on Sister but Deborah. We're working tomorrow, are we not? I, I, I have a date finally. Are you not happy for me? <laughs> So, Sister Deborah, or Sister Derby, okay. musician Sister Derby, she's saying that uh, she wants to do more acting now after starring in uh, Shelley's new movie, uh, Chasing Lullabies. Right. So, uh, she spoke to my colleague Ibrahim Ben Bako, and so we'll be seeing more of Sister Debbie on our screens. Been thinking about acting for some years now, so it's like. You know, it's been over time. When I watch movies, I look at the technical aspects. I look at people's acting skills. I try and put myself in their shoes and imagine, oh, how were they able to do this? How were they able to cry? Things like that. So, um, I've, you know, I've kind of been preparing my mind for this because I've always known that I would love to act for, you know, Shirley or, yeah, you know, good quality Ghanaian movies. So, the mind was kind of prepared and um, I just had to, you know, Learn my lines and do my best. Do you watch Ghanaian movies? I do. A lot? Not a lot, but I mostly watch movies that has Jocelyn Duma or Lydia Forsen in them. And in the past, I used to watch a lot of movies that had um, Amma K. Why? Why these names? Um, these names because I believe they are very good in acting, and so I enjoy watching them. Mm -hmm. Well, you did good in them. Thank were you awesome. so much. <laughs> you wish Sister Debbie all the best. Yeah, we do. Yeah, so uh, you know, my, one thing I must say, I was just watching her as she was speaking, and I wasn't sure uh, what to make of it. When I hear her speak, it's like you think she's of one love, right? <laughs> it's yeah, like, yeah, right. And I'm like, she's she's probably kidding about all that she's saying. Should I take uh, it seriously? Oh, yeah, well, she is a little more serious, but they're all serious people. I tell you, if you if you get closer, you realize that okay, you're serious. Okay. So, we wish her all the best. Yeah, uh, Kitty is saying that the reason why um, we don't have a lot of quality uh, music videos on our screens is because the, the, the musicians or his colleagues lack funding. Well, you can't tell me to shut up. Really? Like, <laughs> I control this space, don't No, he wasn't that. talking to you. He was I thought he was. No. I thought he was. He better <laughs> These guys, they have to be respectful. So, there's uh, the Africa Day concert. It's a virtual concert. It's actually a charity concert. And it was announced earlier today that it will be hosted again by uh, Idris Elba. All right. And we're very excited about it. It's coming on... Uh, on the 25th of this month and uh, easy so we're hoping that this year when are they going to uh, let us know who's representing uh they haven't mentioned so when that information okay. comes out I'll, I'll let you know okay all right thank you very much uh, becky Bex, and see you tomorrow why do you want me to come to work tomorrow tomorrow's a holiday because everybody will be missing you if you if you don't come to work you can figure it out. I beg. Be expecting you to come. Okay? okay. Don't disappoint them. Okay, please. Yeah. Thank you, please. Thank you very much, uh, Becky, for bringing us a uh, show base. We have Let's get on to my journal line. I see the top stories there as well. So, fix the country. Be measured in your expectations of a coup due to COVID 19. That's coming from the chief of staff. And then I won't hesitate to sanction chiefs engaging in Galamse, that's a Santihini. Manor of CTFM journalists arrest Waring Suleiman Abraima of the Media Foundation for West Africa. And then over 90% of voting vehicles are national security premises distributed, that's a former Maslow boss. And that'll be all for those of you who are watching on Joy Prime, but there's more news on the Joy News channel, including we're hearing from the CTFM journalist who was detained and he talking about the slaps he received. Yamen yeah, onion sellers at the Bugushi market have rejected government's plans to relocate them to Ajem Kotoku. According to them, it is unfavorable and bad for business. As part of efforts to rid, the, uh, rid Accra of traffic and filth, government is stepping up its efforts to relocate the 
bulk traders of onion, yam, and tomatoes from their present location uh, to the Ga East municipality. On Tuesday, Regional Minister Henry Korte led a team, including Accra Mayor Mohamed Ije Soa and MC for the Ga East Municipal Assembly, Clement Wilkinson, to tour the market complex and check its readiness for the exercise. The traders are appealing to government to reconsider this decision. Sani Habubakar is organizer of the Accra Onion Sellers Union, which has about 600 members. That place, as you can see, it's, it's not a developed area and it's very bushy. Okay. You know, what we are afraid is that when we move to that place, you know, most of our people, they sell the onion and they carry the money back to the house or to the bank. You know, what we are afraid of, when they sell the money, you know, that place is a very dangerous place. Armed robbers might attack them or something like that. So because of that, we are still pleading the government that for we, the owner, to go there, they should at least consider us. Because so you disagree that government should really locate you? We really disagree because that place, it's not, it's not, uh, let me say, it's not a good place for us because of the forest there and the bush there. What, what if know? government decides to, you know, um, prepare the place well for you, as in take care of the bushes, realign things, reconstruct things, make the a suitable place for sale of your onions. How are you going to take that? Okay, if the government try to do that, I think it will be, it will, it will be good. But the issue is that you know, most of our uh, customers know of this place and it's very, uh, you know, I mean, the purchase is very good. So maybe when we move to that place, I'm afraid like the purchase will be very slow and most of the women will be afraid to go there because the place is not conducive it's very, it's very far, you know, and it's very far. So it's bad for so, it will be very bad for this. What about... Well, Kwabna Musa is a member of the Yam Seles Council of Elders. He argues that government has never consulted them on this issue. And if they are yet, yet coming to tell us, then fine. But at, at, at us now, they've, they've not told us anything. And I don't think they can move us from here to any place. Why do you say this? Because this is the center of uh, the, the, all the markets around here. The, the year market is here, the tomatoes is, is there, and then the onion market is there. So anybody coming to buy uh, his uh, uh, food stops comes around this place, and it's easier for him to uh, buy and go. But Ajayan Kotoku, according to government, also has facilities there you can use to sell your yam. So what makes it so difficult for you to relocate over there? I don't think Ajayan Kotoku, they've, they've never taught us, uh, told us about going to Ajayan Kotoku. And then they've not gone to show us there. So I don't know the facilities there as, as, as at now. And I, I can assure you that, or I, I will say that it is good for us to go there. Like the way we have arranged our market, if you go, you see it's an open place where yam can lie down and then do everything. Uh -huh. So what do you think government should do at this moment for you that will please you or uh, will be able to um, convince you that you will leave this place for that place in order to ease the traffic and congestion here at the population market? We are not... Uh, we don't have any problem about the traffic. If they say we have a problem with the we don't have a problem with the traffic. I don't know why always they have been saying that. Well, we have places for our cars to park and other things. You see, but if you go to the roadside, you see that other cars are, are causing the, the problem, not our cars. And then why is the government sending us to Ajin Kotoku? You see, why is this taking us to Ajin Kotoku? This is the only place that we can, we can stay and do our job. From political followership to economic hardships, there are many risks to violence in Ghana. Often the youth are the biggest actors in such situations. But a women's empowerment organization is working to reduce this risk. The West African network of young women leaders is taking some youth through lessons on conflict analysis and prevention. My colleague Judith Awuchotando has more in the following report. In recent times, Ghana has experienced several cases of violence, from sexual and gender-based violence to ritual murders. Many of them involve the youth. Apart from these, there has been an outcry for changes in the country's systems and structures for a better Ghana. 
There's concern that some of these issues could trigger violence. The West African Network for Young Women Leaders believes it's high time the country took peace building and conflict resolution to the doorsteps of the youth. Ya Sapoma Puako is president of the organization. Our intention is to involve as much youth as we can in peace building and conflict resolutions. We have understood, we have understood that um, if we are good enough tools to be used for violence and war, then I think that we are the best to be used for peace building. The organization, together with the United Nations Office for West Africa and the Sahel, organized a workshop for young men and women to raise leaders amongst them who will set the pace for peaceful coexistence among youth in Ghana. It's, it's sad that um, youth have gone, we've gone this low to be involved in these ritual killers and search for money with all the um, non-existing reasons that we are given. We believe that as part of the training, as we are getting the youth to understand the whole peace process, so it is also about it, because now if you go into a community and there are a lot of ritual killings, that means that the peace of that community is also being tampered with. So that is also going to help the youth in the community. We are we are training them to understand that this is not the right way to go. The organization is, however, calling on government to promote public education and peace building in the country. I think the government is doing its best. I would personally love to see a lot more education, um, by, especially from government agencies, a lot more than they're doing. So that, you know, when authority speaks, the media will do their bits, but when authority speaks, it gives that weight for people to actually um, do what is right. Judith Awotretando, Joy News. Ms. Yenayne Municipal Hospital has assured the general public of measures to improve quality and efficient health care. This follows the accusation of discriminatory care and an overdose of tramadol by a reggae lovers club and the family of Alfred Asante Kwating, who died on April 4 this year. At a joint news conference at the hospital to calm tensions and emotions, management apologized for any unintended comments, adding measures have been put in place to address the gap. It says staff found culpable in the death of Alfred, a.k.a. Ras Tenney, have been sanctioned. Pressure Semivo has more. He started exhibiting symptoms and signs of over overwhelming sepsis. His blood pressure started dropping, including other parameters. Aggressive resuscitation with intravenous fluids, ionotropes, oxygen support were given. However, he could not come out despite these interventions. He was signed off as a case of septic shock secondary to obstructed inguinoscrotal hernia. Although we did not find any evidence of discriminatory comments or neglect as a result of his appearance, him being in dreadlocks, we sincerely apologize for any of such unintended comments. That was Dr. Echo Dennis of the Sunyani Municipal Hospital at a joint press conference in Sunyani on the findings of events that led to the death of Alfred Asante Kwatin Rastini and to smoke the peace pipe with the regular vest club and his family. The club and the family had accused the hospital of discriminatory care due to his dreadlocks and an overdose of tramadol. Anojan, known as Ras Andimola, is the president of Reggae Lavez Club. There has been series of meetings between the hospital authorities, the family, and Reggae Lavez Club. We are believing that the hospital authorities and staff will live up to the billing by giving all manner of patients first class treatment when they need be. We therefore say that they should do this without any discrimination. We are so saddened by the demise of our brother, but we cannot bring him back to life. Rastini's mother, Helen Sewasante, who could not control her tears, advised all healthcare providers to discharge their duties regardless of one's fate and appearance. <laughs> I have two children with my husband, a male and a female, but because the healthcare providers failed to respect the human right, I have lost my child. They should know a royal becomes a slave elsewhere due to situations. Baby, this year, I call them baby aqua. 
the medical director of the Sunyani Municipal Hospital, Dr. Robert Akun, said sanctions have been applied against staff found culpable in the death of Rastini. He, however, assured the family and the general public of measures to improve quality and efficient health care. We are not happy of this preventable death. The incident has made us come to become aware that there is still some gap in the work we do. All the people involved in the management of Alfred Quartin, all those we found culpable, we put in strong sanctions based on the Ghana Health Service Code of Conduct. We've organized customer service programs for our doctors and nurses and the entire staff. Our work here is centered on the patient and the satisfaction of the patient is regarded as the optimum care. We will continue to improve on our services. We are going to work together to make sure that the people of Sunyani and beyond get the quality service that they need. The hospital management appreciated the regular vest club's gesture of painting the OPD and pharmacy blocks with a promise to do more, despite their dissatisfaction in the care of the late Rastini, who has since been buried. For Joy News, Precious Semevo, Sunyani. Now, I don't forget that the slum that houses most of Accra's Kaya. There are challenges with running water and toilet facilities for its residents. In the third of our series on Kaya, Valentina Roberts, a 14 year old whose story we've been telling this week, goes into a crowded private bathhouse to show us the sanitation crisis they live with. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs>
A 43-year-old woman who was abandoned by her husband because she was suspected uh, to have elephantiasis is in great pain. The woman's condition has deteriorated in the past 20 years as the poor family is unable to cope with their medical bills. Her five children left school because she's, strapped, she's financially strapped. Join us as Mahmoud Mohamed Nuruddin reports. You don't judge books by their cover. Sadia seems so happy at home in Boku, but beneath her smile is a heart of pain and rejection. Sadia is suffering from elephantiasis. The story of the 43-year-old mother is held captive by rejection and despair. I had a normal growth from childhood to womanhood and up to the moment I gave birth. My husband and myself traveled to Abidjan in search of a job. There, we worked on a cocoa farm until one day. During our usual works on the farm, a wood pricked my leg. This caused a tiny scratch on my leg, which later developed into a boil. After several unsuccessful attempts to burst the boil, I was hospitalized. In fact, I was nine months pregnant at that time. Two weeks of admission to the hospital yielded no positive results. She had no choice but to resort to herbal treatment. I had no choice but to resort to herbal treatment. The first herbalist I visited failed to find a cure to my leg. The second herbalist I went to, however, caused the ball to burst after a successive application of some selected herbs. The pass that came out afterwards gave me some little relief. At this point, Sadia could sense she was pregnant but could not stand nor walk. I could neither stand nor walk. After two months in bed, I gave birth and miraculously, I was able to walk on the day I gave birth but with the help of a walking stick. Sadia and the husband returned to Ghana to find cure to her condition. She visited many health facilities, but all in vain. Her husband, Seydou Alam, took her to a herbalist in Burkina Faso. <laughs> It wasn't long enough for us to get back to Ghana to seek a complete cure to my sickness. My husband took me to a herbalist in Burkina Faso. I felt completely cured. After three weeks of herbal treatment, my husband left for Ghana to secure money to settle the bills. Three days after he returned to Burkina Faso, the leg got swollen again to the surprise of the herbalist. Let's return to our earlier story about the arrest of the City TV, City FM journalist Caleb Kuda. He's been narrating his ordeal when he was arrested and detained by national security operatives. I, I was sent um, to the national security to have an interview. This was like two years ago. And um, on my way out, I saw some cars parked there, white Chevy cars. And it had weeds grown all over them. I got to understand they were the mass lock vehicles that were caught up in some controversy. So I shared that and I was like, these are... You shared them? Yeah, I shared when? that picture on social media. When, when was this? This was, the first time was pre-COVID, long before COVID. Okay. So when the Fix the Country Now conversation started, I, was, I, I went to look for it and I shared it again. I was like, this is what is getting people angry and they're saying that you should fix the country because there are a lot of young people out there who are unemployed and all that. Well, there was a backlash, there was a pushback. I was told that I was wrong and that those cars had since been allocated to various people and they were no longer there. These are the cars parked? Under the shed, under the shed. right by the wall. Okay. So I was just about making my way out of the gate. And then there was this man in a car in there who saw me and said, hey, where are you going? And then I said, um, I became jittery. I said, uh, I came to see someone, but the person's not there. He said, who was that? Basically, he had seen me. So he was like, why were you taking the videos? 
And then I said, I'm sorry. Um, I, I tried to explain to him why I came. He wouldn't listen. He raised the alarm and said, arrest him. So he, he effected that call. And by Do you know time, around what time is this? Is it 2.30, 3? So, so this should be, in fact, I lost... Sense of time. True. But this was on your way after you had done your... Precisely. Do you know how long you spent in there before you were coming out? Oh, I didn't do more than 20 minutes. It was, it was really... Because you, I've done something... To, uh, so it was a short time. It was a very, okay. really short time. So he, he raises an alarm, and then what happens? And then they come at me, and immediately I w I panicked. So I decided to share some of the photos I had taken, particularly of the white cars, which was my focus, with um, Zoe, my very good friend. So whilst they were coming for you, you did that? Yes. Okay. Just so that, and, and in my thinking, they were going to forcibly take the phone and delete it and caution me and say, walk out of here or something like that. So I sent the video to Zoe. But it turned out they were more, uh, they were bent on showing me, um, they were bent on dealing with me because then they took me to a small post when you enter the... On the left. On the left. There's a mango tree there. There, there are a number of police officers there. So by this time, a plain clothes gentleman had come and was like, yeah, these are the people who are causing blah, 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 blah. No, no don't say blah, blah, blah. Yeah, they said they are, they are causing problems for us already. There is tension in the system and they are trying to kind of... So uh, just, just, just take your time. So the gentleman who raised the alarm yeah. had seen you recording some video yeah. near the cars that you on, were on the way out. Yeah. He raises an alarm. And they were, what did they accuse you of when they initially raised the alarm? They, 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 first, they were like, how did I get in the false entry or something like that? Uh -huh. So then they take me to the police post where we met DSP Azugu. By this time, the gentleman in plain clothes had gone ahead of us to tell everybody that I had come there, I had breached the protocols, and I was trying to cause them some chaos and trouble. So all the police officers there became very agitated and aggressive towards me so the way he reported yes. what you were doing got them angry yes, infuriated and um so they took me to a smaller office i, I showed them my id card to tell them that look i'm from city it, I, I i i agree I, I shouldn't have taken them let's delete it and please let me go but they wouldn't they took me to see as ago i showed him my id card he said who are you from i said city who do you know? i said richard mensa then he called richard didn't even give him um, which is normal. He called OJ, and so by the time he spoke to OJ, in my mind, then it was it was going to be sorted. By this time, they had taken my phone, and they were looking through my chats, and um, they found out that I had sent photos to Zoe. That is when the gentleman started chatting Zoe as though I was the one talking to him. So around this time, he said, "Take a statement." He pushed me. I sat on a chair. They slapped me from the back, and they were... Which of the people are you talking about? The police officers. These are men in uniform. Some were bearded. They had guns. Did you see any names? Masks. Unfortunately, no. You but I not. heard names like Ose and Ousu. Those are the names that I heard. So then... And this is still in the small office? This is still office, in the small office. Very close Azubu's, to Azubu's office, Azubu's near the mango office. tree. Yes. So I saw a very elderly policeman. He looks like the traditional policeman you see because these were younger with beard more brazen i was trying to appeal to them that i've worked with police before i've heard just please sort of pull out to them but this time they had beating him like oh, what will make a cry but they was just still beat slapping me from the back you'd be talking to another one and someone would just come and slap you from the back and you feel dizzy at once you know? and it's like it was so fast and in that same so you heard Caleb share his ordeal. Now, he mentioned DSP Kojo Azugu. He is a senior officer at the National Security Secretariat who became famous during the Ayawasu West Wogon by-election violence. Well, it emerged that he was the man who deployed the seven armed men who stormed City FM in an attempt to arrest a journalist there, Zoe Abu Beidou. General Manager of City FM, City TV, Bernard Avler, confirmed this on Good Evening Ghana Metro TV. There are two buildings, the main big mm -hmm. building, and then there's a smaller building where Azugu's office is. Mm -hmm. So we went there to, to speak to him. Who ushered you in there? The team that, one of the police people who came, okay, said that, come with me. So that is you, uh, Richard Mensah, Zoe Abubedu, and Samuel Atta Mensah. Yes. You all go in there. Yes. Okay. Then you sit down. Yes. He doesn't offer you biscuits and tea. 
No, he, he apologizes for not being the one to come to city. Oh, I because see. Because he says that he, he, he was a bit indisposed, but he would have come there himself. Okay. And then he also, after we complained about the manner, I think we protested. Okay. I think that's a proper word, about the manner the thing happened. He apologized for the way it went. Okay. He says that wasn't his intention. Okay. Because I recall in the interaction with the security people, Samens actually told them that what you are doing is being filmed. So the way you are behaving is completely unbecoming of security people mm -hmm. in an era like this. And one of them retorted that he did not care. Oh, this at CTFN. Yes, so when we got to Azugu, Samens told Azugu that one of your people said this. Mm -hmm. And I told him that the way you are going about this is not the way to go about it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So he did, and Azugu said, oh, sorry, this is not how we intended it to go. Okay. So then he says, they have to uh, take the phone, ask us a few questions and remove the information because they did not think that it was an authorized filming. So okay. then they then go to another building where they say they have to meet the superior and talk to him. So Zoe and Caleb then go to that building. So you don't go with them? No, because we are not... Okay, so Zoe and Caleb are ushered into that building. Yes. You are asked to wait? Yes. All right. And then she comes back with her phone. How many minutes? So this is probably 45 minutes. Well, that's long. Yes. 45 and you, minutes. you, Samens and Richard Mensa are waiting? We were chatting with a lot of people. So it, it's a busy place. So you see, this place is now a ministry and then the National Security Building together. Okay. So you see people you know. There are people coming in and out in the car park. Mm -hmm. So you're chatting with people. Okay. okay. Well, that so it wasn't boring. boring? No, it was not. And it wasn't scary? What happened at City was scary. Yeah. yeah you Actually, know. what happened at National Security was not scary at all. What happened at City was serious. Watch your journeys when we're taking a break. We have uh, more business coming up. Stay tuned. And welcome to business. The Ghana International Trade Commission has invited leadership of the Ghana Union of Traders Association to interrogate the illicit dumping of substandard goods for by foreign retailers. The emergency meeting will also see a review of the framework that guides the benchmark value of imported goods into the country as Ghana loses close to $5 billion annually to unfair trade practices. Here's more. The Ghana Union or Traders Association has warned that any attempt by government to increase the 50% benchmark value will have a dull impact on the trading community. Already, the Association of Ghana Industries, AGI, warns this reviewed alert that a reduction makes Ghana's sports less competitive. This, the president of Guta says, is unfair and inimical to important traders. It will be callous for any group to call for the reversal of the 50% reduction of the benchmark value, which has helped in resuscitating businesses in no small measure. Already, due, due to the above stated facts, factors, prices of goods and services are escalating in the market, and any attempt to reverse the policy will result to unbearable hardship to the general public. The infiltration of Ghana's retail space by foreigners, the illicit dumping of substandard products, as well as the issue on the benchmark values are, among other factors, stark challenges for the average Ghanaian trader and importer. Dr. Joseph Obain questioned government's quest to flash out alien and undocumented retail traders. He believes a lot has not been done despite the establishment of a task force to deal with the matter. In fact, we were relieved when the committee started work to enforce compliance with the law on foreign retail trade in the country. Unfortunately, however, this very important operation halted for no apparent reason. This issue of foreigners in retail trade business has not only persisted but also increased, thereby sparking agitations among members of the Ghanaian trading community. Yes, yeah. 
So far, the Ghana International Trade Commission has opened investigations into what Guta alerts as a growing trend of Ghana's retail space inundated with underpriced and substandard products. We attach here, here to copies of our invitation to a consultative meeting with the Ghana International Trade Commission on the matter, as well as the response of Guta thereon for the perusal of the media. On that note, we wish to appeal to the government to be wary of element within the private sector or the state who may want to use their status and in society to sabotage innovative policies of the state and create confusion in the country. Guta says it is working to draw the attention of the economic management team to these challenges faced by Ghanaian traders. Now, the Ghana Export Promotion Authority, GEPA, has launched a tech-driven export trade information center set up to provide up-to-date export-related information for the exporter community. Now, the GEPA Impact Hub is on the back of the National Export Development Strategy that targets $25 billion of export revenue by 2035. We have more in this report. The GEPA Impact Hub serves as an incubator space for potential exporters, particularly young would-be exporters who will be provided with guidance, navigation and training on accessing export trade information. CEO of GEPA, Dr. Efua Sabia Sari, stated that the launch of Set the Hub as a stepping stone for expanding Ghana's export base. It is our hope and my expectation that we will be able to drive the young entrepreneurs who are aspiring to be the big time exporters tomorrow to the hub as the hub also says as an incubator it serves as an incubator for potential exporters especially young aspiring exporters who need guidance and training on processing and accessing trade information indeed they are our primary target because the future belongs to them. Trade Minister Alan Tremantin has thus charged exporters to leverage on the hub for global competitiveness. He believes the GEPA Impact Hub will complement the $2.5 billion target for export revenues. It is also significant that this Impact Hub is a one-stop enterprise support or export service center. GEPA is at the center of export development and promotion. But the collaboration of the Ghana Standards Authority, of the Food and Drugs Authority, of the Plant Protection and Regulatory Services Division of Ministry of Food and Agriculture, and indeed other agencies, that collaboration is what will make this impact hub succeed and that's why i'm very happy that again uh, efua has been able to bring together all his colleagues uh, to work under one roof the ceo of gepa walked the trade minister together with other dignitaries through the impact hub agencies in the gepa impact hub include the standards authority the food and drugs authority plant protection and other export related institutions now, the Sorticam Ghana Limited distributors of Dulay Probiotic Yogurt has made some donations to the National Chief Imam and for his role in providing a peaceful business climate. The company, during its visit to the Chief Imam, presented some of its products for onward sharing to the community. Now, the gesture was to support the Muslim community through the holy month of Ramadan. There is more in the following report. The company says the exercise is a demonstration of good social responsibility behavior and encouraged other corporate organizations to replicate the humanitarian and kind act. Deputy General Manager at Soticam Ghana Limited, Samuel Lai, spoke to Joy Business. It seemed to uh, encapsulate his role he's played in his country. I mean, the peace of Ghana cannot be over uh, spoken about without his involvement. Uh, the way he's able to bring together both Muslim and 
and not Muslims together in a very communal labor, communal way has really helped that country to enjoy the peace we are. Uh, absence of uh, war is not peace, but in his role as the national chief imam, he's been able to allow us to coexist among ourselves in our multicultural environment in this country. Meanwhile, Samuel Lai says the yogurt business has started picking up following the effect of COVID-19 last year. I, I cannot exaggerate enough. Our estimation from the 2019 year of return sales that really rocketed. We were expecting that same trajectory, but unfortunately in 2020, we had a downward decline in terms of company growth. But we didn't despair. Uh, our investors didn't fold up either. They kept us uh, in business and also the 2021 first quarter is showing very good promising. It's, it's very promising and we are believing that, of course, there's more room for improvement. Sheikh Osman Nuhu Sharubutu commended Sotkam Ghana Limited for the kind gesture, blessed the company with many years of existence and prosperity. Now bring you a summary of business news on the international scene. And that'll be it for business. Gary L. Smith is up next with sports. My name is Charles Aite. Many thanks for watching. Thank you for staying with us on Joy News Prime, second batch of sports. Beginning with the news that Anadi Ranko Kufuado, the president, has fulfilled a promise made to the Black Satellites for winning the 2021 Afghan U20 tournament in Mauritania. The president, you may recall, pledged to give each player $10,000 for winning and honored his promise through the Youth and Sports Minister, Mustafa Usif, on Tuesday. There's one there, following report. The president redeemed a promise made to the players for winning the Under-20 African Cup of Nations in Mauritania earlier this year. The national U-20 team was promised $10,000 by the president of the country when they presented the trophy won at the tournament to him in March this year. A financial reward was made to the team to be split into two, of which $5,000 was to be set aside as an investment plan for the players over a 10 years period, while the remaining $10,000 was to be given to the players in cash. The president redeemed his promise through Youth and Sports Minister Mustafa Yusuf, who presented the money in its city equivalent to the president of the Ghana Football Association, Ket Okreku, and a chairman of the U20 Management Committee, Dr. Randy Abe, on Tuesday. The president personally donated an additional amount of $5,000 each to the skipper of the team, Daniel Afriye Banye, for leading the team, Abdul Fatao Isaku, for being adjudged the best player of the tournament, and Danlad Ibrahim for
for being the best goalkeeper of the competition. Head coach Abdul Karim Zito was also promised five thousand dollars. The pledges made to the players and the coach have all been honored. The satellites defeated the hippos of Uganda 2-0 to win the competition. To rugby and it emerged that the Ghana Rugby Football Union had only 2,000 Ghana cities as their cash balance back in 2017. President of the union Herbert Mensah who has been suspended by the Ghana Rugby Board following um, the group's petition has pumped, we understand, over 2 million Ghana cities into the sport since taking over in 2014. Here's the auditor for Ghana Rugby, Derek Edubwati. 2017. The union made a, a deficit of 193,747 mm -hmm. Ghana cities and it increased to 200,000 in 2020 and also increased to 600,000 in 2019. Mm -hmm. This indicates that there were revenues being made, but it wasn't enough to cover the expenses as at those, day, those times. Mm -hmm. So with those expenses, they had to be pre-financed mm -hmm. by someone and the union president took it upon himself to pre-finance it. So as of 2017, now the union president had to finance his personal finances into the union of amounting to 931,000 Ghana cities mm -hmm. and it increased to 1 million Ghana cities in 2018 and also increased to 1.8 million Ghana cities in 2019. And as of 2020, we had 2 million Ghana cities. So this is how much is owed the union chairman or, or, yeah. or, or the president? That's how much, how much the union, union president has financed his personal money into the, the union. And, and this money has to be cleared? It has to be, yet it has to be paid back to the president. Mm. That was Mr. Herbert Mensah. And this is due to, um, he made, he invested his personal monies mm. and the union is separate from the president. Mm. So the president is a stakeholder in the union. So if anything, it has to be cleared by the union. Right, let's finish with some football. And like I said in the first part of the sport, the Ghana Premier League results are done. Legon cities have won their game. Uh, they needed a 93rd minute goal from Jonah Atukwe to win that game by three goals to two. And so they've gone out of the relegation zone. But this is what the top six looks like. Look at Hearts of Oak. Heart of Oak are second, and now they are one point behind Asante Kotoko. This season is turning out to be all kinds of bat crazy. Asante Kotoko have played a game less than Heart of Oak, though, and Kotoko played tomorrow. Mediama lost today. That was crucial uh, to Kotoko being first. So Mediama are third, Olympics are fourth, Karela are fifth, Dreams are sixth. Now, somebody may ask, why is Heart of Oak second and not fourth? Remember, the Ghana Premier League does not use head-to-head -head during the season. It uses goal difference during the season. And only at the end of the season does it use head-to-head. -head. So if it were the end of the season, Olympics would have been second, the final day of the season. But because we are during the season, hearts are up there by dint of superior goal difference. I am Gary Al Smith, and that's the sport for now. Thank you for your time. Always refreshing. Let's do this again tomorrow. And happy Eid. If you celebrate it. All right, and that'll be it for the bulletin. I'm Israel Thank you very much for staying tuned. You have a good night.